Good morning, everyone. My name is Wei Hua Zhuang. I'm a professor in the Department of Electrical and the Computer Engineering. I would like to welcome you to this EC Distinguished Lecture entitled From Speech AI to Finance AI and the Back to be delivered by Dr. Li Deng. Li was an EC professor at the Iwataru and is now Chief Artificial Intelligence Officer, head of machine learning at the Citadel, which is an American multinational hedge fund and a financial services company. It's my great pleasure to welcome Lee back to Iwataru. Indeed, Lee was the first few people whom I met on campus when I joined this university in 1993. Lee has a colorful career spanned from Iwataru to Microsoft Research and to Citadel. While at Waterloo in the 1990s, his research area was speech signal processing with a focus on speech recognition. In his career, Lee has received many awards and honors for his significant technical contributions. For example, in 2015, he received the Technical Achievement Award from HB Signal Processing Society for his pioneering work on computer speech recognition using large scale neural networks and deep learning as the powerful tool in modern AI era. More recently, in 2019, he received the Industry Leader Award also from HB Signal processing society for his leadership in pioneering R&D on large scale deep learning that disrupted worldwide speech recognition industry and for his leadership in natural language processing and financial engineering. Just a note, this lecture is being recorded during the lecture, please use the chat function to write down your questions. We will have a and a a period at the end. Thank you. Without further ado, <laughs> Dee, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Weihua. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, all the audience. I see the long list of the people joining uh, this lecture. Um, so the topic of our lecture today is uh, from speech AI to finance AI and back. Uh, so this is the outline of today's uh, topics. Uh, I may not be able to go through all three, but I tried to do, uh, to, to do my best. Uh -huh. So the first topic is about how AI transformed a number of industries that I'm talking about high tech industry um that's kind of distinct from finance industry um so i sh i would like to share with you uh some historical um some events that took place i actually many of those events took place in canada uh you know toronto um uh, area uh i was that was about 10 years ago when i was at microsoft research i was fortunate to work with uh you know uh you know canadian uh, superstars, um, you know, to work together on speech and, and, and other areas of research that eventually led to uh, some breakthrough in not only the research area I was working on, but also in many other areas. Um, so I will kind of outline part of the history uh, about how artificial intelligence, modern artificial intelligence, which I call deep learning, uh, has transformed a number of industries, including speech recognition, synthesis, computer vision, dialogue system, autonomous driving, natural language processing, a whole bunch of uh, uh, industries are, are sort of, you know, are undergoing a, a transformative um, changes because of the modern AI introduction uh, about 10 years ago. It's still going on. And the second main topic is to show you how uh, some of the advances in high-tech industry 
due to modern AI, namely deep learning, uh, has transformed um, part of finance industry, investment industry. That's normally uh, it's quite much more secretive than high tech. Right? High tech is a lot more open. So I'm able to share with you to the extent I'm allowed to speak uh, some of the technical challenges that are unique to financial investment industry uh, and how uh, deep uh, learning, uh, you know, in terms of in different forms, um, you know, are relevant to in, in this industry. This new set of industry rather than uh, the high tech that many of you know. And the third topic, uh, um, you know, pertains to some of the additional constraints um, of applying, uh, you know, AI techniques to financial uh, investment uh, management. Uh, and then at the end, I'll go back to uh, discuss how some of the solutions that uh, we have uh, developed um, for solving financial investment problem may come back to benefit, uh, you know, part of the high tech industry. And the reason the last topic is something that that um, that was interesting. Normally, I don't talk about this. Um, and it's just about I think about one year ago uh, uh, in our attribute conference, I was asked to give a keynote speech there. Uh, most of the people in this IEEE community kept telling me that, oh, you know, we are not interested in finance, you know, but please share your experience so that you can help our, um, uh, you know, speech language technology, the one that I, I'm still working on those because they are, they are connected to each other as you are going to see, um, you know, in my presentation and how, what kind of differences and similarity between the problems and what, uh, you know, I have learned in the new industry, finance industry can come back to help, you know, the, the, the high tech industry. So I, I thought very hard about this. Um, so I'm going to share with you, maybe, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, within uh, the, uh, the last few minutes uh, to show you uh, some of the insight that I got. Okay, so now let's go to uh, topic one. Uh, so this set of slides really uh, is not technical. I, it doesn't mean to be technical, um, uh, partly because um, actually I, I have been using these slides for the last few years, uh, you know, with some, uh, some updates. Uh, for this presentation. So the state, this set of slides, you know, usually uh, what's meant to um, to have public presentation, uh, you know, by me in order to recruit my teams uh, in my industry um, after I moved, I left Microsoft to join uh, finance industry. Um, so, so they're meant to be a little high level to show you some high level concepts. I hope that this kind of uh, presentation style will suit uh, the current uh, audience at Waterloo. So what to learn from other industries with the success of AI? And hopefully this kind of discussion, historical review will lead to a finance uh, AI and how similar kind of technology may play some role in this new industry. Um, but I know that in Canada, actually, uh, Bay Street is not nearly as big as Wall Street, but uh, so I don't know how many people in the audience actually are familiar with uh, this industry, you know, you know, investment industry uh, using, you know, machine learning, uh, data science, and, uh, and artificial intelligence. And in US, it's very, very big. So, um, so I'm going to uh, to share with you uh, a little bit about uh, you know uh, the, the the speech industry that I used to work on. I'm still working on that. Um, but with a very, very different angle than, you know, 20 years ago when I was at Waterloo. Um, and also, I uh, so I think uh, for some other uh, industry, like computer vision industry and LP, I probably don't have a lot of time to go over, but uh, I'll see how much time I have along the way. So talking about a uh, speech industry that was disrupted by deep learning, uh, which you studied about, uh, about, about it, uh, yeah, according, according to this slide, right, it's about, about 12 years ago, uh, somewhere around that. Um, so that is actually called NeurIPS now. Um, at that time, it's called NIPS, uh, many people know. Uh, I still go to these conferences every year. Um, I was at Waterloo, I went there a few times, uh, but as, uh, at Microsoft, I, I actually go to the, I went to this conference almost every year as a, a part of research uh, until last year it became virtual. Um, 
So about 10, 11, that's how many, 11, 11 years ago. Um, so I was able to uh, organize, um, co-organize uh, this uh, workshop uh, called the Deep Learning for Speech Recognition and Related Application. Uh, actually at that time, Deep Learning just was just beginning to enter into uh, industry and speech recognition through some joint work that I had with uh, Professor Jeff Hinton uh, from Toronto, who was actually the grandfather of deep learning. And he convinced me that, uh, you know, deep learning technology, actually deep learning really is the deep neural network, right? Um, uh, at that time, uh, you know, about 11 years ago, it wasn't popular, right? Most of people didn't know, uh, didn't do much research on neural network. And I didn't do that either at that time, although, during Waterloo time, I had one of my PhD students working on a neural network, uh, and Professor Jeff Hinton was uh, his uh, external examiner. Um, so I wonder, um, uh, Professor Amasuri is still around, um, and that was joint student that I supervised with uh, with Professor Amasuri, um, and his PhD thesis in 1994 was um, on neural network, and but didn't really work well at all. So Professor Jeff you know, came over as an external examiner and he looked at this thesis this, 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 and then we both passed him. I think he's a professor at McMaster University now, the student at uh, Calais. Um, um, uh, and then so after that, I decided uh, to give a neural network. So well, it's just very hard uh, to make it work compared to hidden Markov model statistical method. Um, and then of course, uh, Professor Jeff Hinton continued working on the uh, neural network and make that much deeper, much more sophisticated way of learning. So I'll, I'll show it with a part of the story uh, in the next few slides. So this um, is the uh, workshop um, um, that to me, it's extremely uh, important uh, sort of milestone in my research. And after that, uh, you know, uh, I was able to convince Microsoft to give me all kinds of resources to put deep learning into uh, industrial scale deep learning within Microsoft and become one of the uh, the very first success uh, in, in, in deep learning for industry. And starting from Microsoft, uh, Google was doing you know, this kind of deep learning somewhat later. Uh, so now, uh, as a matter of I actually spent quite a bit of time uh, updating this set of slides uh, due to this new book coming up. The book actually was by this New York Times reporter, Kate Matz. I mean, he was just launching the book two days ago, and he interviewed me uh, uh, with the generosity of Microsoft uh, for maybe a couple dozen, uh, maybe about, you know, a dozen hours. And we, we were on the phone many times. I was actually invited to go to Microsoft two years ago to sit down with him, discussing part of the history I'm going to share with you. And he actually wrote up uh, this a uh, lot of history of how deep learning entered into Microsoft uh, through collaboration with me. So the book really is about Professor Jeff Hinton in Toronto. Uh, I was kind of supporting, you know, actor there, um, and there are kind of other people uh, in the book. Uh, so what I'm going to share with you before you read, I'm, I don't think anybody read the book yet. Right? It was just launched up uh, two days ago. Um, so the book is a very it's, it's going to be bestseller i'm pretty sure uh at least you know within a technology circle and then he also told me that chinese the largest chinese uh, publisher is already translated the book uh in china it may come out anytime uh so it will be international uh internationally read uh book um so it, in particular in chapter four here uh, uh there was a lot of uh you know stories about part of my work at uh, University of Waterloo. Do you see that? Uh, when I was at Waterloo, the kind of work I was doing, you know, I, I went through a whole bunch of um, you know, interviews with him and Microsoft said, fine, say anything you want to say. Uh, there's no constraint, because, partly because I left Microsoft at the time when I was interviewing with him. And I was brought back to Microsoft just, uh, you know, to, to talk with him. Uh, so a lot of stories here are quite, uh, you know, you know, new. Most of the people didn't know all these stories. So, uh, so I'm probably share with you part of the stories in the book. Uh, now to do that, I'm actually going to uh, to share with you some of the slides here. So so yeah, they talk about Professor Jeff Hinton. Uh, talk about one of my students who wrote a thesis exploring neural networks as a way of recognizing the data. 
da, da, and then he became um um so but that was many years ago that was 1994 while i was uh uh i think he was my third phd student and professor Wei Hua Zhuang, i think just re uh just joined in the waterloo uh 93 right i remember so that phd was written in 94 and then what happened was that uh the, the book is is right i mean he said that although he uh professor Hinton held tight to the idea of neural network speech recognition was never more than a uh, side interest at his lab and that meant he and that uh and me actually moved in a very different circle so i was mostly in attribute circle and professor Hinton was mostly in kind of uh machine learning circle in NIPS. so i was i was actually in both um but you know my most of my activities is within actually uh you know because speech recognition is part of actually technical activity, not machine learning as much. But now machine learning has everything, right? You know, speech recognition probably has more in, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's equally, you know, between actually and, and the machine learning. Machine learning actually has its own society. It's a very, very different society. It doesn't have any central, uh, you know, organization like actually. But I, I, I have been spending time in both. Okay, so I'm just going to share with you some of the, uh, some of the stories here. I, I, I'm not going to, uh, to go through all the detail. But important thing here is that this part is important. I would like to share with you. Uh, that is, uh, the, and this is actually also part of the chapter four. They talk about when Jeff Hinton and his student joined the forces with me at Warren Houston, and the company has embraced the technology inside the speech lab. Workshop that I just showed you earlier was 1990. Uh, it's a Sorry, it's 2009. The year after, he sent two of his probably one of the most uh, uh, the smartest uh, students, PhD students. Actually, one is master student, the other PhD student, come to do internship with me, and to bring in GPU technology into Microsoft. But that at that time, nobody in uh, uh, speech recognition and, and, and machine learning uh, were using GPU for computation, and it turned out that. This is one of the most critical aspect of pushing the neural network to be extremely successful at Microsoft. Without GPU training uh, through the expertise at that time from Toronto, you know, all the computation would, uh, would be very difficult to carry out uh, using neural network. So I, I have been, I personally have been using, I actually have a research team under me uh, using hidden Markov model and also many of these kind of deep generative model based on Bayesian network, many layers of network, but the computation is so difficult. So we have to use a lot of approximation without being able to use the GPU to do neural net style of learning, right? So, um, so not only algorithm changes, but also uh, the computation changes from the traditional way of doing machine learning for, you know, at that time for voice recognition and many other applications that I was working on. So in 2000, uh, late, 2012 that was about two years three years uh after very intense work so we microsoft managed to put neural net deep neural net the one i actually collaborated with professor jeff hinton uh, as early as 2019 into our product so over here it says after google rolled out speech engine into android phone um i wasn't quite sure uh google's client at that time but uh, within microsoft we start a lot earlier and according to the book, so Jeff, he, Professor Jeff, he also sent one of his another graduate student into Google, and no one believed it's going to work. And then, and then somehow, when Microsoft became very successful in deep learning in micro, in speech recognition, that was that happened in 2010 already. I think somehow, I mean, if you know certain things has been already successful, then it's much easier to convince other people. You know, it can be done. So according, I think according to the book, and okay, and also according to what I learned from Jeff Hinton and his student who was sent to um, to Google, I think that was 2011 or 2012, to make everything work over there. Um, but Google is very, very quick to push that deep learning into speech engine. I heard only a few months, whereas in Microsoft, it took almost two and a half years, maybe maybe two years, somewhere around there. It's a lot slower. Microsoft, because, it's, because uh, you know, research is segregated from product, right? So there is a barrier, but now a lot of things change because of this kind of deep learning experience. How in the big company research uh, department uh, and product teams need to work together. Uh, by the way, the other guy that went to Google uh, also went to finance industry, <laughs> so we become good friends again. So here, the that part of the book talk about Rick Rashid. He was actually the head of research at Microsoft, who actually saw the success of deep learning as speech recognition, um, and then he decided to have a very large scale 
demo, you know, actually it turned out that that's in China, in Tianjin, in 2012. Uh, I think in October, and then there the are a little detailed description about that, how uh, this uh, demo went. And that was the first time, my knowledge that big learning, uh, deep, deep learning success has been publicized in the large scale. Um, so this guy, John Markov, he's the uh, the writer for this article. This, I think it's a full page article talking about, that's about, about one month after uh, the demo event, like he's in the Microsoft top uh, scientist, uh, it's, it's a, the head of research. Is that our, our boss who gave this demo and he talked in English and he used to, to speak deep learning to translate, to use deep learning to recognize uh, his English into uh, text, right? That's speech recognition. And then there was a separate translation system to translate the recognized uh, English from his speech into Chinese. And then there was a speech synthesize, synthesizer that display his voice using his accent, his tonal, you know, uh, effect into synthesis. So when he talked in English a few seconds with a few seconds of delay, then his converse, uh, Chinese version of the speech actually was sort of play out in the audience. So this audience has about 3000 students and professors uh, in Chinese university. And that was very good. So, uh, so that was about the time, um, uh, you know, somewhat earlier. So the author of the article came to Seattle to interview me, and then we talk about some of the. Um, you know, he also interviewed with the professor Jim Hinton. So, uh, so this article that uh, that was about how many years ago now? Nine years ago or eight years ago? Uh, you know, kind of excited uh, the whole community, technology, high tech community about deep learning, how important it is. So basically, within just one year after this paper is published, uh, this article was published in New York Times, and Microsoft by that time already had deep learning going on uh, with my many of my uh, my my team's uh, effort. It became mainstream just within a very short period of time. And at the same time, I think uh, he, uh, Jeff Kinton uh, has uh, a team of um, of graduate students uh, working on deep learning for computer vision. They also broke the record for a computer, the tra from traditional ways of doing computer vision. That their organization was run, I think, by Fei Li from Stanford, ImageNet, and that became very famous also. That was the success of right after uh, speech recognition. That was, you know, achieved by both Google and, and Microsoft. Microsoft was somewhat earlier. But anyway, let's show you a little bit technical aspect of this work. So during this uh, demo, uh, he actually trained his speech within Microsoft. So we actually optimized uh, our recognizer for his own speech. Right? So that's uh, if you look at this curve, on this, this will actually show you how important uh, you know technology is. Right? So his demo, a uh, registered demo, actually has about seven percent error rate. That was 2012 for two for his own speech. So if you look at the progress for this uh, technology, you can see that. So in uh, 1993, this talking about spontaneous speech recognition, it's not like when you read one. Right? It's about recognizing the way. The speech the way I speak now, you know, it's called spontaneous speech, you know, in the public. So you don't think about you are talking for computer. Okay. This is very different than the standard uh, speech recognition prior to those old days where people know that they are talking to speakers, they become very careful. But now spontaneous speech recognition meant that people just talk the way they are without aware that you know the, the 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 voice are going to be used for computer to recognition therefore people talk more casually you know many of very often they are not grammatical that's fine people can understand each other so so in speech recognition industry people already are uh, th that's actually due to government effort up top part so i was very actively participating in all this effort while i was at university of waterloo um i think um you know waterloo i think should have a bigger team uh, in speech at that time, the progress is very slow. So when I was asking our chair, I remember uh, 20, 20 some years ago, when I was chair, well, let's hire another professor, you know, we can have bigger team on voice recognition. I think I could answer that. Are you saying you're not good? If you are good, you can do it all by yourself. You don't need another person, right? So, you know, our team is very small at Waterloo. And that's actually one of the reasons I moved to Microsoft because there's not much critical mass in speech recognition, at, you know, at university. Uh, in US, similar, but a lot bigger. But industry has much, much bigger resources, much more emphasis, uh, you know, of getting resources together to tackle big problems there. So think about this, right? So this, uh, from 1993 to about about around the time before I left for Microsoft, the 
error rate keep dropping. I mean, so in the beginning, 1993, when the database just created for spontaneous purification by you uh, are by uh, that kind of nest is by US government. A lot of data are available. The error is almost 100, but everything you say is wrong, right? So, and the neural net couldn't solve the problem at that time because probably because data wasn't big enough and probably because computing wasn't fast enough. And also probably because people didn't know that neural network really is the, eventually is the key to solving the problem. You know, none of those were available. People, many people try and none of them got success. So I personally let neural network uh, to do, you know, Bayesian statistical uh, uh, signal processing and uh, modeling for voice recognition. So uh, the, the, the error keep, uh, keep dropping. The reason why error was keep dropping in the old days is because every single year they got a competition, government just add more data. You know, so in old days, uh, the error dropped down about 20 some percent. That was about the time I left Microsoft. So I was contributing a lot, you know, when I was um, uh, at Waterloo, contributing using hidden mark of, hidden mark of te uh, technology to drop the error with the more, you know, fine tuning of the model. But after, uh, you know, a while, so the model just couldn't do much better. So I spent a lot of time at Microsoft trying to solve practical problems like adding noise, but not the fundamental technology solving spontaneous spatial energy problems. So over almost over 10 years, the error rate, you know, more or less stayed the same. But it doesn't it sometimes it drop two percent, five percent, sometimes ten percent, and then if you change the new data set, you know, in, uh, the error shoot up again. So people really just struggling very hard about to solve the fundamental problem for spontaneous speech recognition. And and then and then on average the progress is very very little. And until uh, uh, Jeff Hinton showed me, I think 2008 at, at the conference, uh, that uh, the part of history actually was in the book to show me that say Lee, you should go back to look at deep learning because there is some interesting new development. And at that time in 2009 and 2008, we didn't realize that the large data was a big solution at that time. You know, we thought that. The algorithm probably, you know, to make the architecture deeper and also making algorithm uh, that at that time it wasn't even the standard uh, neural net algorithm. Uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, people talk about pre training using uh, deep belief network, that kind of generative model, right? And then of course, you, after you do fine tuning, things are getting better. But anyway, so all these stories are in the book. But the whole point is that only when we go to companies uh, like Microsoft at that time in 2009, we got large amount of very large amount of data uh, to uh, experiment. Uh, and then through that trial and error, we realized, and then and soon, you know, the whole industry realized that uh, it's not the algorithm that actually, uh, you know, count for the success, but the, the amount of data, the label of the data, and the way that a GPU style of the machinery uh, that can speed up all the learning that matter the most. And of course, that was 10 years ago, right? But over the last two or three years, things changed back again. Uh, many people are looking at the small data problems because many applications besides speech and vision, they don't have a, a, that much amount of large amount of data. And also when you have very large amount of data, you need to adapt to the new environment. You know, a lot of uh, new AI uh, paradigms require something to revisit, you know, the new algorithms rather than just brute force. A large data problem. So at that time, 10 years ago, uh, what makes deep learning work well is number one, realizing that using very powerful uh, GPU style of computing on the very large amount of data and using very large neural network that has large capacity to absorb the data as well as the, you know, to make use of the computing, the faster computing of uh, facilities uh, is really con contribute to the huge error uh, reduction. Uh, just within one year, the error dropped almost about 30, 40%. And then if you tune a particular speaker where, well, the error rate dropped down over here. But nowadays, you know, after, uh, you know, I think last ICAS I went, um, that was about one year ago, um, the error rate for independent speaker independent recognition rate dropped down to below human recognition. It's about four or five percent or something. So the progress uh, was extremely fast. So so for large scale speech recognition, uh, um, you know, computer can just do almost as good as human. In many cases, are doing better. But so this is the, the architecture at that time about nine years ago. But so far, things don't cha haven't changed a lot. Right? 
there are a lot, not a few technical improvements for architecture, but the paradigm in voice recognition using very deep neural network within large amount of data and also using some innovative ways of doing dynamic kind of modeling. We, at that time, 10 years ago, I, uh, in the deep learning, I, you know, my Microsoft, uh, you know, colleague and myself actually are still using hidden macro model to control the dynamic, uh, you know, and, and the neural network here really just serve as a way of sort of extracting features to fit into hidden macro model. So that's one of the reasons why this new deep, that deep learning paradigm can very quickly uh, go into industry without actually changing a lot of decoding strategy. So after uh, you know this time, pretty much the research direction for speech recognition has been laid out carefully, and then Apple as you hire you know some of the uh, our our top Microsoft researchers uh, to develop their own speech recognition, and then I think I think that was about 2013. Apple actually started this uh, deep learning. Uh, so, so speech recognition, a new speech recognition group using deep learning. I think my boss at Microsoft got recruited by, by Apple to do Siri, you know, a speech recognition using deep learning. Uh, and then Google, of course, became much bigger. And, uh, and, then, and then Facebook, you know, all this uh, company after this time started to do uh, deep learning. And then very quickly, not only speech recognition uh, has been turned from statistical method in the old days, into uh, deep learning uh, in a paradigm, but also computer vision, robotics, and, and the, uh, deep reinforcement learning. You know, all this kind of uh, new technology was developed based upon uh, the concept of using large amount of data and using deep neural network to extract features uh, and then train them in very powerful machines. And of course, there are no, a lot of new algorithms developed. And many of those are based upon some kind of new way of thinking about machine learning problem, you know, like, you know, deep reinforcement learning in AlphaGo, they all came uh, soon after all these uh, breakthroughs. So I I'm, I'm probably don't have time to go through all the detail, except to let you know that this is extremely transformative research that took place about 10 years after I left Waterloo, and then all this experience accumulated from Waterloo and also in Microsoft, so to contribute to uh, my realization at that time that you know, paradigms should be changed and neural net is a really the right way of doing that. As long as you know how to design the architecture, make that very deep and that the, uh, the concept really came from Professor Jeff Hinton and then how to make use of very large amount of data, how to make the computation, you know, efficient to be able to, to train all this amount of data. But now, nowadays in neural, natural language processing like GPT-3, I don't many people will know, uh, you know, they use the same kind of paradigm, well, except that they use the, now is the transformer architecture rather than just the fully connected neural network or recurrent neural or L. So there are many technical, uh, you know, into, but the paradigm of having data, uh, and another big change now, uh, you know, today versus 10 years ago was to move from supervised learning where people need to label all the data. In speech, that was no problem. Because you know, U.S. government actually provided tons of supervised data over you know in the 1990s and 2000, uh, less than 1990s, uh, and then and then the key is that every time when you develop better technology, um, you know, getting more and more data, you get and then you can use whatever recognizer to label data automatically, right? So the labeling data wasn't a big uh, bottleneck. Uh, now it's very similar here, whereas in many other applications like um, like in natural language understanding. Then the labeling, people don't even know what how to label data. You want to say you want to understand, uh, you know, uh, a text. You don't even know what understanding mean, right? How do you define the schema? You know, the, for finite domain, you can do it, but for open domain, it's very hard to do that. So people move from now from a supervised learning into what's called self-supervised learning. I mean, in the sense that this is unsupervised learning, but in, but the way you train it is still supervised learning by the way of identifying supervision signal from existing data, right? So, you know, people call the uh, self supervision. So I don't have time to uh, survey all these modern uh, modern uh, techniques, uh, except to let you know that many of these modern techniques beyond the kind of work I just surveyed you, uh, to you about 10 years ago, we just started deep learning. Now, many of those have been applied in many, many op uh, applications, including some of my own, own research. Uh, in the finance industry. So in the old days, right, in our speech recognition, you know, people pop in IEEE, Signal Processing Magazine. So actually I was very lucky to be able to write this paper with Professor Jeff Hinton. Um, and he called the shared views of four research groups. 
And there's a very interesting story about how this paper was written, right? So lessons that I learned from academic work is that, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't, don't, yeah, that, that probably applied to other professors and, and, uh, and students. You know, don't, don't try to squeeze, you know, when you get a small idea, you know, people write the paper, you get about 10 citations, 100 citations, 200 citations, and that's not as a worthwhile of focusing on very important problem and write a very powerful paper. So I think this paper, last time I checked, it's about 9,000 and probably 10,000 citations now in, in any case. And then people are in this deep learning community, not only do publications in IEEE, but also do nature, you know, science, nature. A lot of great people, papers are published in those very top magazines. So I'm very happy that uh, the deep learning out of our research actually went to very high profile publications. Okay, so now I want to, yeah, this, how much time do I have? Wow, I don't have much time. Um, So let me, uh, so I have another 20 minutes of time, right? So let me quickly go through connections between uh, voice recognition and finance industry. So I'm, I'm making some transition from uh, voice recognition to uh, finance industry. Uh, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to say a lot of details about how finance industry are, uh, are exploiting uh, deep learning. And that's one reason they hired me four years ago from Microsoft. Um, so I, I share with you a high level about, uh, you know, the similarity and difference between these two type of machine learning problems and in terms of architecture. Right? So for speech recognition, we have uh, many modules, right? So I don't know, uh, this is kind of presentation, standard presentation about 15 years ago. But nowadays, uh, speech recognition are similar, except many of the components are unified, right? So you have uh, training data that goes to acoustic model, a lexic model, and language model. And then they are, they, you know, in the old days, they are all trained differently. Acoustic model, they use acoustic data and, you know, labeled you know, text to train them. And then let's model is trained using dictionary a language model is trained purely from text data. Right? And then you have to integrate them to apply all the constraints together to go through the search algorithm in order to recognize the word. Right? So my uh, research at Waterloo and also at Microsoft in the old days, you know, we focus on acoustic model a lot of time on acoustic model. And that's how signal processing come in the picture, right? Because the acoustic signal is kind of signal that our signal processing technique, doing Fourier transform, doing all kinds of very sophisticated nonlinear transformation on male frequency, you know, for those of you who actually work on that. Actually, it turned out that all these, um, you know, pre-processing, signal processing now have been replaced by neural networks. So there was actually a conference uh, a few years ago, I remember, at IEEE Signal Processing, the title of, you know, workshop or something, you know, very big one, uh, it's called, that's, I think the title is the that's Deep Learning Spell, the Death of Signal Processing, something like that. Because a lot of signal processing uh, technique now uh, that requires, you know, the training, that requires the learning parameters, they can be absorbed to be part of the deep neural network, right? So, but deep neural net can make that, you know, everything nonlinear and, and, and signal processing could be linear, could be nonlinear, linear, which become very trivial. And nonlinear models can be very easy to absorb by neural network, you know, typically at the lower level and at a high level, you can do other things, right? So a lot of signal processing problem actually become part of neural network problem. So I don't know whether other part of the actual application, like, um, like communication, uh, you know, signal processing and communication research, they have been impacted in the similar era. So we what do you know much about uh, any impact of uh, deep learning in communication industry? Uh, still in research, I would say. I see. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so, so by physical processing uh, and in machine learning, it's so widely used. All the big companies are jumping into that about 10 years ago uh, since Microsoft started, you know, showing, you know, everything is promising. So it becomes the standard. If you don't do neural network, people don't even public accept your paper anymore, you know, at least for speech and, 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 and computer vision and natural language. So the whole point in this slide is to show you that in the old days, all these components are separately trained. Now in the new deep learning era, all three components, the modeling part, are integrated into one single big neural network. Okay, so that's a, a, a very big change, right? So in Microsoft, there used to be, you know, a separate department in product team doing acoustic model, and then another set of department in doing language model, and then separate ones are doing. And but typically, language model and search are linked together because because you know they, they have shared some a lot of similarity in the component. And now deep learning coming into picture, they all merge into one single group. Right? So that's actually the uh, the the message I'm to convey. So deep learning allows for the unification of many different components in the traditional visual recognition and many other computer vision systems. 
So I wonder whether in communication industry, if you are dealing with many separate models, you used to learn this, you learn this, you learn using different data. And if you actually can apply deep learning, many modules of models, uh, you know, can be unified uh, through what's called the end-to-end -end learning. And this is a very important concept. So I actually brought this kind of concept into uh, into finance industry. Now, before I joined, uh, 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 Citadel, um, that was four years ago. It took me a while to decide to join, to quit Microsoft. So part of the reason is that Microsoft told me that, wow, well, don't worry, just explore. If you don't like it, you can always come back, right? So I have no risk there. Uh, so actually I turned out, it turned out that to be, to be very, very rewarding, uh, opportunity because I encountered a very, very different problem. But on the other hand, if you look at, so this is a book, so I'm not able to tell you anything about what I do at Citadel, uh, per se. But I can share with you some of the public information. You know, this is a very good book. So this is probably the first book I actually read uh, after I decided to join Citadel. So I look at this diagram. So in, in financial industry, in order financial industry is um, you know the investment industry. Uh, so it's called a quant quantitative trading, right? So typically they have a model like this quant trading. This is just one part of the investment industry. The, the different part of the industry I'm not going to touch on, like Warren Buffett. You know, he's doing fundamental research. It doesn't belong to this kind of model. Okay, but this kind of model is like our company is doing that. And about maybe half of the uh, Wall Street firms are doing this. I think Toronto also has this CPP, right? So they, you know, I, I get to know them. Um, uh, there's a very big, uh, you know, firms in Toronto. They are also, you know, they are actually establishing kind of this kind of research they contact me a few times but i get the chance to know that but this is very quite mature in in the wall street i think about 40 years ago or maybe maybe 30 years ago 1980s or early 1980s or maybe 70s people started doing that it's called hedge fund right? so they have this alpha model i don't I, I don't i don't have time to go through all the details alpha model is a little bit like a acoustic model you get the raw signal that it's relevant to investment, right? And then there's a risk model, there's transaction cost model. It's a little bit like, you know, you have this model, you have this model, model. they're all trained differently. And when I went to the firm, I saw, you know, I talked to an individual and then there's a, a portfolio construction model. And that's a little bit like, you know, a little bit like, um, you know, like this component that optimize, you know, they make use of this model to optimize the solution to get the best of it. So of course, you know, I'm uh, coming from speech community so I naturally will think about how this kind of paradigm can be used for investment process. So for the sake of time and also for the sake of conversation, uh, conversation not giving away a lot of detail, I'm not going to go into detail of those, uh, but except to let you know that if you compare a different modular structure, you know, in this industry versus in the industry and what's the right solution to solve this problem, and then, of course, you know, you can kind of imagine what kind of problem can be used for to be solved, you know, for this industry. So due to the time constraint, I want to go to, let me skip natural language processing part, because this is a very important part for not only for high tech industry, but also for finance industry, right? So natural language processing is, you know, you want to be able to read financial document to understand, to distill information for the investment purposes. And before deep learning, there was no way, and the people have to hire uh, company have to hire people to read the report, to read the news, to and then to get insight and then distill into it. I don't many of what now deep learning allows all the things to be uh, unified. So I'm going. So I was lucky enough to be able to. Uh, so uh, Microsoft allowed me to, you know, do a lot of publication. So I actually uh, wrote this book, you know, right during my transition to from Microsoft to Citadel, and Citadel allowed me to uh, to complete that book, and then getting uh, you know uh, other people to help me to do that. So we wrote a whole bunch of chapters for this. So let me let me show you um, a few uh, key aspects for this before I jump to some core, uh, you know, components of this topic. So there's one, you know, chapter talking about a text-based uh, dialogue system or, or speech-based dialogue system. They're, look at, they're all done by deep learning. So this diagram, maybe show you some positional language understanding. It's all done by, uh, by neural networks. So that was, uh, the book was actually done in about two, about two years ago. So by that time, neural net became almost everything. Look at it. Machine translation is all done by neural network. Uh, this is question answering, all done by neural network. You can think about how application, what kind of application all these techniques are. Sentiment analysis, and that's much more directly relevant to finance, right? You want to know this kind of financial or financial report news is positive or negative. They all help. It's automatically done, you know, by sentiment analysis. It's all done by neural network. And there's another very interesting uh, application, which actually now are having a lot of good 
uh, application within Microsoft context that right, which I can tell you a little bit more. Uh, this is uh, uh, what's called image text, right? So we speech recognition is the speech to text. Now, uh, when you have image here, then computer the deep learning technology is able to use uh, not just image recognition technique, but also to use the language generation technique in combination with the image processing by deep neural network to be able to just say what this image refers for refers to. And then people now, I think I just read some paper just recently published by uh, by Facebook uh, research. They are talking about analyzing videos, hopefully doing something similar. You know, if you show us a segment of videos, it actually not only can predict what the next few frames of videos are through self uh, supervised learning, but possibly I haven't actually read that part yet, but I have seen, you know, a lot of presentations over the past couple of years that many big companies, including Microsoft, talking about how to tell a story from the video automatically from analyzing video. And that's a very, very big application, right? If you can do that, I mean, even the video prediction could be very useful, right? For example, you get a surveillance, you know, camera, and then if you're in a crowd, you know, it, it, it can, it can, it can predict that, you know, within se next uh, five seconds, somebody is going to take out the gun to do shooting, right? In Canada, probably it's okay. In the U.S., it's terrible. Uh, the, a lot of schools, you know, uh, get uh, a lot of violence here, you know, and then they can, before uh, they, uh, they take a gun out, you know, you know, Alarm can be can 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 be on, so may scare you know the criminals or maybe police can arrive before they shoot. So there are a lot of great applications for this kind of technology. So far, I haven't seen any commercial application for this kind of video to text, but at least for image to text, that was done actually about five uh four about five years ago, simultaneously by Microsoft Research. Actually, I was one of the uh, uh authors in the very first paper in this application. Within Microsoft, and then also, I think Stanford University, Google, Facebook, all these major companies are doing this kind of tech, image to text. And now, slowly, they're going to move to video to text. It's much more difficult. And the Microsoft created, uh, I think, created one of the major database for text to image, uh, for image to text. But anyway, this is another uh, great application in natural language processing. Okay, so I'm going to have about next ten minutes, or uh, five minutes, to quickly go through um, some major technical challenges unique to financial you know, investment uh, in terms of quantitative uh, finance. So number one is the heterogeneity, heterogeneity of big data. So in our um, finance industry, we don't call it big data, we call it alternative data. They are alternative because, because they are, you know, the standard data that people use for financial market prediction is market data, trading data, and also fundamental data. Those are standard. If you don't use them, you are going to be out. Right? Over the last few years, uh, because of the rise of deep learning, people uh, realized that many other data sources, like we call it alternative data, can be very useful as well. Okay, so, and the second one, uh, I'm gonna go uh, go, uh, go over uh, by, uh, one by one. Uh, yeah, so these are the uh, alternative data, sort of the five size span, and these are the type of data. So it could be individual data, like social media data, because social media data talk about speech. Like anybody know much about a GameStop kind of event? You know, that's, you know, people talk about all this, you know, a lot of information can be gleaned from social, you know, mining social data, you know, if you use the deep learning, you can understand what they are talking about, and then they help you know, financial uh, firms to predict, you know, certain stuff. And then there's, there's a business data, bank, uh, banking records data, supply chain data, corporate data, finance data, and the sensor data, and the IoT data, cellular image data is very big. And, and, and let me show you, you know, the reason why cellular image data could be useful for finance is because now computer vision technology due to deep learning has recently been matured, right? So they can analyze, you know, the parking lot of certain company if they're always, uh, you know, empty, but not over the last year. Right? Last year is an exception, right? Because everybody's uh, everywhere is uh, is empty. You know, normal times. If you know, uh, if uh, you know, Walmart parking lot is always empty. That's it says something about the business Walmart. But if they are full, all time full, uh, then it says different things about. So surveillance is important. And geo geolocation data is more weather forecast data is more especially for commodity. And web traffic data is very important. Uh, and uh, app usage data and you know, all this data, uh, we call the alternative data. And many of those are in the form of natural language, such as, you know, social media, data, some news data, uh, et cetera. You know, a lot of corporate data are in the form of natural language. So 
natural language understanding, natural language processing, how you can get the right information from those uh, alternative data is a big challenge to finance. So I'm not able to tell you uh, our solutions, except to tell you that all these data that are listed over here, uh, text to speech data, uh, image, video data, multimedia data, all the uh, you know web data, app data, business data, corporation data, weather data, they're all very useful. And the second challenge is what's called a very low signal force ratio. So in our, so what I remember when I was teaching 318, still 318, it's communication system. I, I don't know what is still 318. So I was teaching this formula, signal force ratio defined by this. And you know how to define signal power, you know how to define noise power because you know, the, in communication system, you have fixed ways of measuring the size of uh, the problem of uh, the noise. Uh, that's very rough uh, for the standard, you know, problem outside the finance. It's relatively easy to quantify all these numbers. You know, see at certain type of certain level of signal noise ratio, what kind of performance you, you can get in, in the communication systems. Whereas in finance, everybody knows that signal noise ratio is extremely, extremely low, very often less than zero dB. But how, how much you know? Uh, people don't know how to quantify them, so we actually have a way of dealing with the very low signal to noise ratio. So to tell you, give you some example of why uh, signal uh, noise ratio is so low. You can think about social media, right? Many people are talking about stocks, right? And um, they are not expert, right? And very often they, you know, even the news has the fake news, right? So fake news is a typical example of the noise, right? So, you know, when Trump, you know, have a tweet stock going up, you know, and then he has another tweet stock going down. And so this type of uh, event, you, if you think of those of the market data as your you know, prediction, uh, you're totally misled, right? Because they are just noise, right? So Warren Buffett will have a very good way of this, you know, taking out the noise from his brain. Whereas AI uh, need to have a similar kind of capability to you know, not only to detect fake news, but also to evaluate how useful those social media data is. Sometimes their noise is so high, you know, like children, they are talking about stuff, they are talking about nonsense, right? They are not very good, you know, they are, you know, like people from high tech industry very often, you know, they, they view the stock market with, you know, their very narrow, uh, you know, mind. And those, you know, many of many of their discussion could be treated as noise, but some part can be signal. So you need to distill the right uh, signal from the noise, in you know, a very, very big noise. And that's a very big problem. So I'm not able to share with you the solution. Um, so, uh, and then another very unique prob uh, problem uh, in uh, finance is a very strong non-stationarity. And it's not just a, you know non-stationarity that we talk about in communication system, in signal processing, in, uh, in mathematics, but uh, but to talk about the cause, the nature of the non-stationarity, which we call the adversarial. So the reason why uh, stock market uh, changes, you know, the, they have different regimes, right? You know, it's not because, uh, you know, like in speech recognition, we have non-stationarity, you know, signal changing from one time to another. When you get different kind of sentences, you have different, but that kind of nationality is, 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 is not a big deal, right? You can very easily adapt to this nationality, whereas in finance, that kind of nationality has an adversarial nature it's because of competition from the market, right? So there are so many firms are doing kind of, you know, people are, are, are competing against with each other in the real time. And that causes nationality. So you cannot easily adapt. If you adapt, very often you adapt things wrong rather than in speech and some other languages, applications in other technology. So I'm just going to, uh, now for example, the deep, deep fake, right? And then you actually, uh, well, this, I'm going to give you a little bit solution to this, right? You actually can use your understanding about the nature of the nationality to design the algorithm to come back against the nationality. And that's kind of part of the what deep fake, you know, solution looks like. So the final uh, topic I'm going to go over quickly is about some additional constraints, uh, which are very different than, than high tech. Well, I'm going to emphasize you know, the data privacy issue. And the very important here issue is the scarcity of talent. A lot of people uh, in finance industry don't know much about computer science. They don't know much about, you know, mathematics in terms of, uh, how to make a large scale uh, implementation of algorithms. You know, maybe they know algorithm well, but they don't really appreciate the scale of the problem. Uh, whereas the other side, you know, people in computer science, they very often get confused about what the finance problem is. You know, they think they take a lot of their concept, 
like me, right? So when I first joined uh, the finance com company, I was bringing speech recognition, you know, concept into there. And then every now and then my colleagues said, oh, this is wrong, right? And I learned, you know, the more I do the work, the more I apply my skill to, to the new uh, industry, the more I learn what kind of differences there is. Uh, unfortunately, there's uh, too much of this kind of rich source of information I won't be able to share here. And then finally, I've just spent a few minutes talking about how this kind of uh, the learning that I have got, got from a finance industry can come back to benefit speech and language technology today. So, uh, for example, the heterogeneous data solution that we developed um, at, at finance really can come back to help uh, speech recognition to handle multimodal data. Right? So very often, now in old days, you know, we just use acoustic data, you know, and text data to do voice recognition. But in reality, uh, communication requires a lot more sources of data, like image data, like facial expression, like lip reading. How to combine all these data together to achieve better human-to-human -human communication goals? That wasn't. Yeah, there was some work done in that area, but people probably never appreciate how big scale that can be done until I realized that, wow, we saw a lot of problems uh, in finance using much more heterogeneous data than this kind of um, multimodal data that we can see, we have seen, right? So the key to all this is that uh, that's due to deep learning, right? In the old days, when you have image, you have speech, you have text, they're all different modalities. So you have to combine, you have to assemble learning to put, you know, different uh, sources of information separately. Whereas in deep learning world, everything becomes embedding, right? So speech, uh, you know, process can be treated as embedding. Embedding means a vector. Uh, and that's actually one of the reasons uh, you get a vector institute there, right? So because Toronto people uh, really believe everything is a vector. Um, you know, sometimes vector is big, sometimes vector is small. I, I do, I believe that too. So if the semantic, uh, you know, you know, the meaning of information is similar, whether it's expressed in speech or image or text, they really should be embedded in the same space. Therefore, all these uh, different modality of the data can be uh, treated uniformly, just like you know, uh, in, uh, in 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 uh, in the standard neural network framework. Okay, and therefore uh, you can actually make uh, transfer learning and so many kinds of uh, machine learning much more effective. Now, the low signal to noise ratio problem. Uh, before, when I was working on speech recognition, I was very worried about you know the noise, right? You know, chip noise. Actually, actually, the first five years when I was at Microsoft, I was focusing on solving noise problem using hidden Markov model. It's very difficult. So once the signal to noise ratio goes below zero dB. Like you know, like in the helicopter, like in the very noisy office, you know, our recognition rate just keep dropping. And then, and there are many ways of doing that. And then, of course, deep learning came around. You know, even for cocktail party, right? The signal to noise ratio uh, could be much less than uh, zero dB. And then, human typically have no problem. You just pay attention to uh, the speaker you are listening to, whereas all the other noise, you know, for other speakers or uh, broadcast in the airport, right? They are louder than what you are listening to. Uh, but they are noise, right? So you begin to focus on attention. Whereas now in finance domain, we actually kind of solve the problem in a much more principled way. And then in the key here, you know, is the attention modeling, right? That's actually that actually originally came from deep learning. You pay right, you know how to pay right attention. Therefore, high signal to noise, uh, the high noise level can be ignored, right? Because you know you have the attention mechanism doing that. So we have a lot of we have some a lot uh some very good solution to that. Uh, the, uh, now, for adversarial nature, I probably won't be able to say much about this. And this is this probably involves right modeling of you know game theoretic framework and embedded in deep learning to deal with the adversarial nature. I think that's all I have on my presentation. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Now I'm like I'm ready to answer some questions. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you. Um, there, there are some questions. Andrea will read the questions to you. Yeah, please. Hi there. Um, so the first question that we have from the audience, it's a two-part question. Um, is how can I break into the? Oh, sorry. Um. Yes, actually, how can I break into the financial industry, whether in US or Canada, using my MNG degree at Waterloo? How to break into financial industry with MS? I, my personal experience is that finance is much easier to 
enter then some other specialized domains, right? Because finance, number one, it's quite intuitive. And number two, it involves a lot of technology, right? So the slide that I showed you earlier about, you know, those modules, and many of those are familiar to engineers. To me, when I look at the module, I said, wow, in speech recognition, this one could be a good model, this one could be language, something like that. So there's a lot of similarity between the two. So short answer to the question is, number one, you have to have the passion to solve the problem. Number two, you should have an open mind to not to stick into what you're familiar with, right? Uh, you have the right tool from MS, you know, from Waterloo. You know, Waterloo is probably the, 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 uh, one of the best universities uh, in computer science. Uh, actually, I, actually at, at Microsoft, I had a lot of Waterloo students. So you have have open mind uh, willing to accept advice from experts, right? Even if the expert may not know much about computer science, right? Because their experience, successful experience are very, very, so in my case, I mean, I, you know, one of the things, I'm, I'm still a technology person. So when I look at uh, uh, experts uh, opinion uh, about, you know, the kind of their success, you know, strategy, I always map their, uh, you know, thinking into machine learning paradigm to see that, wow, you, the way you are doing this, let me map that into um, different ways of regularizing my models, right? Because regularization can be extremely wide, right? And if you are good, you can regularize model well to deal with the, to deal with non-stationary, to deal with data overfitting. So just, you know, so short answer is that have a passion and also, uh, you know, to be open-minded and then with uh, keep your right skill. So most of the skill that I have uh, at Waterloo uh, and, and Microsoft now uh, get very uh, well applied to finance. So I never regret. And as a matter of fact, one, one of the reasons they want to hire me is because they I have that skill they don't have at that time. They, or maybe they didn't have enough of that kind of skill. So to keep your skill and everything you do, you know, in terms of programming, in terms of your algorithms, in terms of thinking about computation, you know, should be kept as your asset and then be open to new problems. And that's my advice. Thank you. So the next question is, which is related, is what courses would you recommend to break into the financial sector with an AI background? What do I don't know what to look offers any financial counsel. What do I have one of the best, uh, I think, insurance, you know, applied math, right? Uh, or, or maybe some other... Um, other department. So I think computer science are classes. Uh, if you get a chance to learn natural language processing, you should learn it. And if you have opportunity to learn artificial intelligence classes, you should learn it. Machine learning, yeah, Waterloo, uh, I think computer science has some very good uh, computer science, uh, machine learning uh, experts, right? You should take their classes and the EC department, I don't know how many uh, how many machine learning uh, people uh, EC has been hiring. I don't remember. So if Professor Wei Hua Zhuan, you know, is teaching some uh, you know, communication classes with a lot of mathematics, modeling, uh, you probably should take it. <laughs> uh, a lot of communication uh, signal processing are quite relevant. Yeah, you're talking about how to, uh, you know, uh, but coding itself is less relevant, right? Uh, but how to uh, to optimize, you know, certain things is at the core of uh, finance. That's also at the core of specialization and also at the core of communication, right? networking stuff and those classes are all very useful now in terms of i personally never took any financial classes so one of the reasons but they believe you know why and four years ago when i was microsoft they asked me to um but i did some reading right uh you know one of the um material uh one type of material i read in the past was about like martingale theory you know probability uh in finance right so I actually told them that when I took uh, information theory class when I was a graduate student, I never, I never really, you know, uh, mastered that aspect well. So I worry that I may not be able to, uh, you know, this is just, a, you know, measure theory, it's just not in my blood, right? It's just, you know, I'm doing very uh, practical work. And actually, um, the city out there, and actually the CEO approached me, I um, just basically said that, well, it's because you don't know that we will want to hire you. If you know all this Martin Gale theory, they're all outdated. Your brain will be filled with uh, with the garbage. So it's not going to be good. <laughs> so in terms of mathematical depth, I would encourage to to go very, very deep in mathematics. You know, doing uh, doing applied mathematics, uh, understanding, you know, the basic problem theory and then have probability thinking, that's important. And then uh, uh, I don't know what kind of uh, financial classes uh, that offer the offer, but I know that in University of Washington here, in applied math, they offer some financial engineering classes, which are very useful. They teach you how 
how uh, derivatives are traded. There's a very sophisticated model. It's called a black short model, and there are many, many versions beyond that. And the, the concepts are very useful. So I personally actually took one, a couple of Coursera classes from uh, Columbia University. It's online classes. And that to me, it's, it's more than enough for me to, uh, to take my job. <laughs> so I think taking financial classes is just not as If you have financial background without computer science background, now the modern, uh, you know, a finance a firm may not want to hire you. But if you are computer science, uh, maybe having a few years of work a high tech industry like Google, Microsoft, or, or, or Facebook, even if you've done anything about uh, finance, they may be willing to hire you because they believe that you're smart and then you can be trained yourself, you know, very quickly or just by working with people. So having solid technology background probably is more important than uh, then taking some finance classes. The, the best is you, 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 you do both, right? That's my answer. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next question then. Many of the AI applications are industry driven. What can you tell us about using AI to improve human lives? For example, cognitive abilities. Why not use AI dueling with humans who are challenged by AI applications to improve human learning? Yeah, so this is a good, a very good uh, question. This is a very difficult problem. Um, so AI improving human learning. Um, I, I, I know a, quite a number of startup companies in Silicon Valley are doing this, but so far I haven't seen any good success. Right? So AI in education, improving human cognitive. I mean, there are a lot of things, you know, you think about uh, like Elon Musk you know, doing, uh, you know, putting, you know, uh, putting connection directly into the brain, you know, to, you know, uh, there, there are some AI elements into there, right? So that enhanced. Uh, but I just personally haven't worked on that. I realized that uh, the difficulty of this problem, uh, this is not the standard machine learning style of the problem, right? Where you do prediction, you do, you understand the world. And they also involve a lot of maybe medical kind of uh, regulations, right? If you want to uh, to do certain things to uh, to implant. Um, but I know certain academics, some of them using AI to do some very interesting things. But I think they are, you know, facing a lot of hurdles in that there's a lot of regulation on that space. If you want to put some, uh, you know, device inside a human brain, or maybe I don't know whether this is what the, uh, the, the question is meant. Uh, but actually one project I'm, uh, I'm actually able to share with you while I was uh, uh, sitting out there. So my, my company wouldn't mind. I'm sharing that. I don't know whether that kind of, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the example can be, uh, you know, an example for the answer to this question. It is how to use AI to help improve the productivity of investment uh, experts. So in, in my company, I have, so I have many, I have, I have many very, uh, you know, extremely good uh, fundamental analysts, analysts, but everyday life, they're so busy, right? So they are so, you know, absorbed by everyday uh, life. They have to read this, have to read this, they have to read, they have to synthesize them, and the AI can help them to uh, save a lot of time. They spend, you know, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of material, they don't know whether they should read, right? They are reading maybe hundreds of documents. And some of the documents may not be relevant, so AI can filter them up, right? So they don't have a read. Say, that, oh, this is relevant, given AI understanding about your goal of your job. They can clear up, and that could be, you know, uh, one way of reducing the the load, the time spent that people will have. But in terms of in directly improving the cognitive capability, I think it's a very difficult problem. I don't have any uh, any good answer to that. Next question, do you have? Next question will be, given the rate of development of AI, where can philosophers and cognitive scientists help in guiding conceptual frameworks and potential slash eventual paradigm shifts? Yes, I, yeah, for philosophy, I don't know. Actually, I think they are maybe a bit too far away, but cognitive scientists, yeah, I work with many cognitive scientists. So as a matter of fact, while I was at Microsoft, I was actually, uh, I hired, one of the best cognitive scientists from John Hopkins University, full, a full professor. And it was very, um, I believe that their work are very relevant to AI. Now, how relevant they are, you know, it will require a lot of work because AI nowadays is quite brute force, right? Now, deep neural network, it's, uh, you know, the one I talked about earlier today, you know, about 10 years ago, you know, still between 2009 to 2012, it's extremely brute force. A lot of engineering tricks there, you know, I was used, I was able to use the engineering insight as well as my understanding of the speech, not from cognitive perspective, but from a machine learning perspective, signal processing pers perspective, and computational perspective to make the whole thing work well. 
Now, for cognitive scientists, they are actually reaching some much deeper level of AI. I think next uh, breakthrough will come from the newer AI models that can really understand the world and to really understand the documents rather than just doing the prediction of the documents. So nowadays, I don't know how many of you know GPT-3 from OpenAI, um, and they are very, very good. Um, they use about how many? 150 billion parameters, you know, in the model, very, very large. And they use almost all, uh, you know, data you can possibly get from internet, from, you know, books, you know, all together. And they are actually simply uh, can predict the next sentence, you know, not only next sentence, but you, you give it a prompt, you can just, you know, write up, you know, the whole article for you. Uh, but looking inside how they achieve uh, this type of, uh, you know, amazed, uh, you know, capability, it sounds like you can write an email for you, you know, you can have to answer the question, you know, all this, um, you know, but I personally, you know, uh, play around with uh, that kind of tool, finding that there is really no good understanding. You know, it's not like human, the like cognitive system, they can understand uh, what you read and then, you know, and then do certain things. Right? So the tasks are limited, you know, for translation, you don't have to understand what you, uh, you read in English before you can put them into Chinese by machines by deep learning, because these are just a signal to signal, symbolic signal from English to Chinese symbols in, uh, in you know, they, they look very, very good, right? They are almost as good as human can translate in many cases. Uh, but that is, that they, but this involved no understanding what, whatsoever. So if you actually uh, can do perfect translation from one language to another, you might human actually typically understand first before you translate, otherwise the quality is not going to be good, right? Uh, if you simply just, you know, do the translation from, uh, you know, word to word, you know, translation from dictionary, you are not going to, you know, to get a good, you're not going to get a good, good result, right? So I think cognitive science would have a good role to play in achieving human-like understanding in this deep learning system so far. You know, that involves not only just architectural change, but also involves different ways of training, different ways of, you know, uh, but how to do that, I think, uh, you know, they have to work with very closely with uh, AI scientists. A lot of the models uh, uh, proposed by cognitive science, they are not aiming at building system. They are aimed at understanding how human process information, right? And that kind of theories, cognitive theories into practical AI system, which build machines that can duplicate, you know, aim at duplicate uh, a human cognitive system, uh, that's a very, very big gap at this point in time. So I think, you know, the role is important, uh, but the gap is very large. So, uh, but for philosophy, I have no idea. I, I hope not, right? Because otherwise they are much further away than cognitive scientists. So I have another question here. I'm current, it's from the audience. I'm currently interning at a Canadian bank in their AI department for capital markets. I've noticed that it's not as easy to work on financial AI products on an individual level due to the lack of open source options. Do you have any recommendations to work on more open source financial AI products? Uh, not, not, to my, not to my knowledge. So if your team is small or especially your individual, my recommendation is that when you look for uh, AI tools uh, to use for your investment purpose, always try to get open source a code rather than developing it within yourself because now one of the big change that I found uh, in the industry that actually started from uh, a high tech industry, right? So I remember 10 years ago, uh, Microsoft published a lot. So I published tons of uh, uh, material. I wrote books, you know, I, I actually quite, but of course, you know, some, some real secret, you know, a company will say, you don't publish, you have to go to approval. But in, by and large, Microsoft did that. And then, um, and then Google, uh, I think, a few years after that, they realized that in order to compete talent and also to improve their reputation, they, they have to publish also. I think Google started, you know, taking Microsoft research model, doing all sorts of publication. I think since 2003, around that time, you know, now Google probably published publish more than Microsoft <laughs> because they got so many more people are uh, experts there. So, uh, and, and the publication is not just the papers now. They publish everybody in this AI space, as long as they don't work directly to, you know, the company's product directly, they open source all their codes in their papers. You know, that's actually one of the criteria for review papers. And one of the questions is that, do you have open source to share with 
your reader. If they don't, they, they, you know, their papers acceptance uh, rate, uh, you know, become lower, right? So there are a lot of wonderful open source for most of the papers, the good techniques in AI uh, techno uh, te technology. So try to make use of them as much as possible rather than developing uh, so, uh, unless you have a very big team. If you have a very big team, you know, you can do something tailored to whatever you want. But any open source directly relevant for finance, my answer is the not to my knowledge. And finance industry is much more close. You know, you know, people can understand why, right? Because, you know, it's a competitive, much more competitive than high tech industry. Because in high tech industry, people compete over talent and people compete over data, right? So if you enter into the market, you get the data and then you can do other things, but much less competing on technology. Uh, and that's one of the reasons they don't mind publishing a lot of their papers, the data, because, you know, different companies have different data. If you know how to, if you don't have data, it's hard to, you know, compete against the others, even if you have the technology. And uh, finance industry is, is different, right? So that's one of the things I learned um, because data, you know, a lot of them are in common. You know, we just bought a lot of uh, Bloomberg data, right? Uh, you know, many, many companies use that. So, so te te techniques are you know, much more important. Therefore, they are very secretive. And that's one of the reasons I can tell you uh, detail about you know, what uh, we have been doing, uh, except at a high level, right? So I think for this reason, I do believe that uh, the open source specifically for finance, you know, uh, financial uh, capital market is probably rare or not. That's, uh, I, I, I didn't even try to, to search for that. <laughs> yeah, that's my answer. So then this is very unfortunate, right? It's very unfortunate. So that's actually one of the reasons uh, many of talents prefer to go to high tech industry. So I try very hard to build my team over the past, uh, men, uh, you know, the, especially the first uh, two, two, two to three years while I was a CEO there. So many of the really, really good talents, they, you know, they got fresh PhD from Stanford, from MIT, you know, some, you know, some Toronto. Uh, I, I haven't hired anybody from Waterloo uh, for some reason. You know, some great talents, you know, at, at the end, you know, I actually managed to get some people from industry into my, my team, but not fresh PhD, partly because I believe partly because of its closeness. So I don't think that's an easy way to change at this point in time. But if I could, I would like to change, right? but, you know, due to the business, uh, it's much harder to do that thing compared to in high tech industry. So, so the answer is, uh, well, I'm very sorry, you know, uh, not to my knowledge, that will be a good uh, open source, uh, you know, information in finance. What the data, there are some, uh, no, no, actually, I, I probably should make some, uh, a few exceptions. Uh, there are a few academic, you know, from business school, like uh, the business school, uh, you know, in US, I don't know in, in Canada that they do that. Uh, they actually produce a few uh, open source data coming out of our uh, finance domain. So you that that may be, you know, but not not in terms of open source, uh, high quality open source uh, code. So if you do research, machine learning research, AI research, uh, to see whether your techniques uh, are good or not, you should. You should, you should you should try to use open open source database as much as possible. And in, in particular, there is one I think a booth, uh, University of Chicago booth, a school of business. Actually, I, I they, they they actually have some some a few very good professors. You know, they are all good friends of mine. I actually talked to them. They actually wrote some very you know important papers using those public uh, database, but they actually, my understanding, they wrote their own code to do that. Okay, now, um, because of time limitation, maybe we, we do the last question. Okay, so the last question for today is, I'm a mechatronics student at the University of Waterloo. I've taught myself machine learning and deep learning using TensorFlow and Keras. Is there a chance for an engineering student to break into the AI field without a computer science degree? Yes, of course, of course. Yeah, of course. I think engineering degree, like ECE uh, students, right? Maybe just almost as good as computer science uh, student. I, you know, I know both uh, department. Nowadays, I know more work from computer science department because I think ECE department doesn't seem to hire machine learning, right? Maybe AI, machine learning are part of computer science. Um, but actually, signal processing of I think maybe communication as well. A lot of work done is part of computer science. Like in speech recognition in Waterloo, while I was there, I was in uh, ECE department. Whereas at our computer science at Carnegie Mellon, it's all computer science department. So there's a lot of overlap between the two. But I think in terms of the training engineering, but I don't know, I, I'm not sure other uh, department like mechanical engineering, I don't know their training curriculum, but 
ECE training curriculum have a lot, especially the software engineering, right? I don't know. I suppose the software engineering program is still there. Yes. There, the student there can just do as good job as computer science. So I came from ECE and my, my PhD also came from ECE and my teaching experience also from ECE. When I went to Microsoft, I have no problem. Very quickly, I adapted just within day one. So I certainly believe that ECE student, but not sure about other kind of engineering, they may have any difficulty of doing, uh, you know, deep learning uh, that typically were done by computer scientists. So, and then a lot of people that I hire, you know, working on finance, they came from ECE too. So I personally don't find uh, much difference between ECE training and computer. Well, except computer science training, they probably write better program. They they want to have you know much more right you know, I think the style of the program they are writing are very different. <laughs> but in terms of the algorithms, they are you know some in some in some aspect ECE will have better uh, you know skills in developing algorithms. Whereas uh, computer science there, but it depends. I mean, if you are specialized in computer science in machine learning AI. I think in terms of algorithm, uh, they are just as good as you know engineering. In terms of programming, uh, which is very important um, to be able to understand the modern way of doing programming, not just scale programming, you know, distributed programming. I think easy, you know, people may not have the official training, but but it's not hard to catch up quickly. Okay. Yeah, um. Yeah. Th there are a few more questions, but the yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, I think have time. Yeah, I guess they have. Well, I still have 10, uh, 10 minutes of time. Uh, um, minutes, uh, you still have... want to go? Okay. Yeah, okay. So yeah. maybe Andrea, we can keep it going. Yeah, keep going another 10 minutes. Okay. So do you foresee that at some point the sheer computing power will be unable to keep up with the deluge of data? Are we looking at models that sift through data to determine garbage data from useful data? Yes. So the first part of the question, uh, I, I think that uh, computer industry now, uh, like NVIDIA, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, a lot of, you know, chip company are contacting me, asking me to help them to, uh, to do analog computing. And so many good startup, and then and then you, you look at big companies uh, in U.S. I don't know. In I think in Canada, uh, this kind of company is not very popular, right? You know, chip companies. No, uh, Huawei is pretty good in China, but they are banned in U.S. Right? So they have good uh, presence in, in in Canada. That's good. And China is very big. You know, I have many friends uh, who who did uh, deep learning in computer vision with me doing algorithm. They returned to China to start up all these big companies. Uh, the, there are a lot of good big companies, uh, chip company in China. In US, it's very big. So given my knowledge about chip industry, um, hardware industry now, focusing on building and including many of these uh, startup companies just doing analog, you know, computing for, for deep neural network, you know, for the sake of saving energy, right? Given my knowledge about, you know, how vibrant uh, this uh, set of industry, uh, mostly in US and in China, I have no doubt that this development computing can catch up with the deluge of data. The second part of the question is, are we looking at models that sift through data to determine garbage data from useful data? Yes, yes. There are a lot of algorithm on that. I, I can single out a simple one. You know, I do a lot of uh, work on that uh, in the finance industry uh, as well as at Microsoft, but I don't, I don't see any single easy solution that can be easily described like the one that disrupts speech recognition, right? And especially and you just make a very big model uh, and then with some tuning on the architecture it solved the problem now for the problem you just mentioned sifting through uh you know just separating big uh you know uh no uh, you know bad data versus good data this is a very standard uh machine learning problem and um, there are a lot of good good uh, good solutions um but that has to be you know depending on different applications so the answer is yes are you ready for the next question yes is it viable to use AI trading techniques for personal trading or personal portfolio, or is it only effective at a large fund scale such as Citadel? The first answer, the first question is no, and then of course uh, the answer to the second question is yes. Right? And the reason is simple, right? Um, for personal portfolio, uh, because um, it, number one, it requires a lot of. Uh, I don't know how much people know, right? There are two styles of of the investment. One is the fundamental investment that like Warren Buffett style. Uh, they use their understanding of the company using focusing on fundamental. The other one is a quantitative trading. Quantitative trading, the one I, uh, that's the main focus of my presentation, uh, absorb all the information, including fundamental information. It's just one part of the information. But it actually look at the, it's a, you know, we think about that as a data driven, uh, you know, investment. So, uh, but it relies on, on a lot of computing power to do that. 
uh, it absorbs more data, but it doesn't really understand. Uh, it doesn't need to understand all the details. Uh, so it's more like you know machine learning, right? You train the system, and you may not need to know exactly how the system, but you look at the similarity between training data and the future, and you understand how to regularize so you can deal with the nice scenario. Well, at least the philosophy for for uh, for data, and they require a lot of uh, power. Now, for for personal trading, you know, the, the number one, I don't think it's worthwhile, right? Yeah. So I, I I don't know how much I can say about this. Now, for quant trading, typically the world, you know, it's not just you know a, a small portfolio of stock, right? It's a, it's a very large you know bracket, right? So it. I just don't think I personally never get a chance to uh to uh, to apply, you know, <laughs> what I do at work to my personal portfolio. So usually large companies do that. And there are smaller companies doing that, but they typically do high frequency trading. So the one I'm talking about can be high frequency or low frequency or mid frequency, right? So for high frequency it's almost impossible uh to do it uh individually, uh because you know you need to have information very, very quickly. You have to buy, you know, flow order, you know, all this. But for the relative longer term, and then I think the longer term investment you have, the more you need to use fundamental knowledge uh, and less for the uh, sort of uh, data-driven knowledge, right? Because it's harder to predict using data to predict in longer term. Just like you want to predict the tomorrow weather, it's easier, right? But if you want to predict the weather, you know, two years from now, it's uh, out of luck. Right? So there is a uh, you know, horizon issue here. So the answer in general is, uh, the one I, I heard the problem is, uh, the question, uh, the answer is no and yes. Okay, we have the last question. How does the time variable factor into the NLP modeling processes, since the time is the key to a lot of trade plays when considering getting signals from ML methods? Yeah, so that 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 comes down to the horizon issue, right? So yeah, so if so, time varying, I, I yeah, I I don't know. Uh, the question refers to time varying within minutes or time varying within weeks, right? If the time within uh, minutes, it's a little bit harder, right? Because you know you have to adapt, you know, in a different way than if you, your time horizon uh, is longer. But if horizon is longer, then I think uh, the role of NLP probably will be more important, right? Because you can afford to understand more documents rather than within very short period of time. Yeah, that's my 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 my, my quick answer to the question. Okay, so um, so maybe I think we got to stop here. Uh, on behalf of the EC department, I'd like to thank the thank you for inspiring presentation. Also, I'd like to thank everyone for being here participating in this lecture and this concludes the event bye for now okay thank you very much everybody thank you very much professor Zhuang, and thank you very much andrea to for organizing uh this event i appreciate it greatly thank you thank for you. joining us